classes in statistical mechanics. Lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics, Springer Verlag, 2000. And today, this lecture is Lecture tw 12. <clears throat> lecture 12, Solids, Non-Interacting Quantum System. Today we're going to continue and finish off our discussion of models of crystalline solids. In our last lecture, we discussed the question, well, what sort of motions do objects in crystalline solids have? And the core point is that you have objects connected to each other. They're connected to each other by harmonic oscillators, and therefore, uh, they're connected to each other by springs, I should say, and therefore they act as a whole bunch of coupled harmonic oscillators. And the no normal modes of a whole bunch of coupled harmonic oscillators in a solid are sound waves. They're sound waves that, by convention, come to a stop at the edges. That is, the edges are all clamped in place. And therefore, the normal modes look like sine waves that have zeros at each end. However, you have a sine wave in the x direction, a sine wave in the y direction, a sine wave in the z direction, and any one of these is a normal mode of the system. And we can see that approximately on, if we start on page, the start of section 11-3, which is the Debye model, and the actual point is that equation 11-10 is the wave equation for waves in a crystal. That's essentially identical to the equation for waves on a string in one dimension, except the waves are now allowed to move in the x, the y, and the z direction, or, or since they're standing wave, to oscill have oscillations. Now, you might ask, well, what is oscillating? It's a displacement vector. And there are two sorts of sound waves in a solid. There are sound waves in which the oscillation is this way, and the particle displacements are like this or like this, and those are transverse waves. Those are waves on a string. There are also waves in which the oscillation direction is this way, and the particle motion is, as I am gesturing, a compression wave. Uh, transverse waves and compression waves do not usually have the same speed of sound. We're adopting the simplification for this chapter that all the sound speeds are the same. If you put in the statement that the speeds of sound are different for transverse waves and for uh, longitudinal waves, you get some extra notation proceeding through, but there's really not much new physics. Furthermore, we will put in the assertion that the solid is nicely linear, so you can make the wavelengths of the waves shorter and shorter and shorter, and the speed of sound stays the same. And therefore, the frequency of the waves is simply linear in the wave number. That's an approximation, but it's an okay approximation. It's not a perfect approximation for all systems, but it's an okay approximation. Well, from equation 11-10, there is a solution, equation 11-11, which shows a wave as a product of three signs oscillating along the x, y, and z axes, and a cosine omega t, because the whole thing is oscillating. There are boundary conditions. Those waves go to zero at x equals zero and x equals some distance, which I simply call L. And in order to have zeros at each end, it must be the case that the number of waves between one side and the other is a half integer. So you can have one node or two node or three nodes. You don't need full waves. And in order for that to be true, the three wave numbers, kx, ky, kz, must all be given by the equations 11-12, that is, they all have to be n pi over L. Okay? We now need to take a break because there's construction outside. Hang on a sec. You're away in one second. You are in the way, but
Okay. So, nx, ny, and z are the number of no of the number of nodes plus minus one in each direction. They're not quantum numbers. Uh, at least one of nx and ny and z must be non-zero. Um, they can't all be zero at the same time. Okay, we have coupled harmonic oscillators. They have an energy. And in the end, we have n particles. Each can oscillate in three dimensions. So we have three n coupled harmonic oscillators. Yes? Well, if we have three n coupled harmonic oscillators, we could put quanta into each of those three n modes separately. And so we need 3n quantum numbers, and the 3n quantum numbers, n1 through n subscript 3n, are the number of quanta in all of those nodes, and that's given by 11 equation 1113. Now we recycle a math argument we use many times in dealing with separable systems. Namely, the energy is a sum of individual terms. So what does that tell us about the partition function? Partition function has to be a product of terms, one for each mode, and the partition function can actually be summed. It's the same as the partition function for a single <coughs> harmonic oscillator repeated three n times. That's equation 1114. Now, if you get to equation 1114, in fact, you should do the calculation to take us from 1113 to 1114. And you should also do the calculation to take us from 1114 to 1115. And that can be done over break. Okay? And so you calculate what the average energy is. And the average energy, well, uh, it's equation 1115. It's a sum of the energies for all of the harmonic oscillators, and each of them has a rest energy h nu over 2 for its h nu, and each then has a contribution h nu e to the minus beta h nu, etc., the second term in 1115, and that second term corresponds to the energy of a harmonic oscillator stored in its various energy levels. Okay, we now do a little some math tricks. And the first point is that the math, the um, frequency nu is determined by nx, ny, and nz, and the relationship is in fact given by equation 11 17. If you don't think 11 17 is correct, what you should do is to go back to equation 11 11 plug it into equation 11.10 and put in values for nx, ny, and nz, which are the same as kx, ky, and kz. And when you put in those values, the second derivative with respect to time of amplitude delta, that'll give you an omega square is the same as a nu square up to 2 pi. And the other side of the equation gives you the other side of equation 11-17. Okay, now we do, having said, nu is determined by nx, ny, and z. What I say is nx, ny, and nz are really close together, so we can treat them as a continuous vari set, set of variables. That's a bit of a cheat. And having done that, we will then say uh, we can replace them with their magnitude n. The direction doesn't do anything, but the magnitude n does, and therefore nu is given by equation 11 18. It's cn over 2l. <clears throat> okay, so now what we're going to do is say we have a frequency which is determined by this one new variable n. n is not a quantum number. It's the magnitude of the vector nx, ny, nz. And therefore, 
we can go in and we can replace the sum in 11-15. That's a sum over nx, ny, and z. We can replace the sum with an integral. <coughs> and the integral we get is shown in 11-19. That is, the sum over nx, ny, and z becomes a three-dimensional integral over n squared dn and two angular components, which I've already integrated. Okay, well, n is related to nu, that's equation 11-18, yes? So we can replace n with nu everywhere it's found, and we get a new equation 11-20. If you take the partial of 11-20 with respect to temperature at fixed volume and number, you get equation 1121, which is the specific heat. And you just have to take the derivatives to do it. In fact, in 1121, you can see the DDT hiding inside, because everything else is independent of DDT. Now, there's one little bit of this which I haven't quite mentioned. Um, NX, NY, and NZ can't go up to infinity. Why? The system only has 3n modes, and therefore nx, ny, and nz between them are constrained to give something like 3n modes, and so their upper limit has to be something like the cube root of 3n. So what we do is to say, how, we can write 1121 in the form of 1122. 1122 has the form, the average energy is the energy for a single mode, I'm really rewriting 1120 into 1122, is the energy for a single mode, e bar of nu, and we multiply it by the number of modes having frequency nu, that's a density of states, and we add up over all values of nu. So 1122 was basically the same as 1120, Except I've said there is an energy for each mode, which you can see, and then you just add up how many modes you have with that new. Well, if that's the number of modes with that new, then it must be the case that if you take integral d new, n of new, just add up the number of modes for each new, overall frequencies, add it all up, you must actually get the total number of modes. You must actually get what is shown in 1123, namely, you add up the number of modes at each frequency and you get the correct total count of modes. Well, if you do that, you say there is a highest frequency, nu sub d, the Debye frequency, and you can write the Debye frequency in terms of the number of particles, the speed of sound, and the length of a side of the system. There's a, one little trick in 1124, which is not quite as obvious. It was originally calculated saying we know C, we know L, and therefore we can define this new sub D. But I could also say I will treat nu sub d as the key parameter, and therefore I can use equation 11-24 to eliminate, I, indeed I can, to eliminate the speed of sound. And what I am left with is that nu sub d, there's the speed of sound, and the remaining thing is in fact, if you take the L inside the cube root, is n over l cubed, the density of particles in the system. Okay. Now we come to the point where there's a technical issue, and it's shown by figures 11, 2, and 11, 3. You might ask, well, gee, you said there are three n modes, but why did you say it was the three n modes of lowest frequency? Why did you choose that particular set of 3n modes to be the modes of the system? Why didn't you choose some other set? Uh, the first issue is that if you start 
reducing the wavelength of the oscillation, eventually you end up with the two oscillations shown in figures 11.2 and 11.3. If you look at the thick lines, those are the waves, and you notice the wavelengths of those two modes are very different. See that? However, the atoms in those two pictures are in exactly the same places it was drawn that way. And therefore, while you might say there are two different wavelengths you could associate with this oscillation, uh, the atom positions are exactly the same. And if the atom positions are exactly the same, it's the same mode. So those two objects are the same mode. And in fact, if you put in the k corresponding to those modes and ask what the frequency is and do the correct calculation, not the speed of sound calculation earlier, you get figure 11-5. 11-5 is not the same as 11-4. 11-4 is what you get for frequency against wave vector in a continuous solid where you can have all wavelengths and everything is uniform. If you've got atoms linked together, the K, the K versus um, <coughs> frequency, or maybe I should say frequency <coughs> against K, has this pyramid, this sawtooth structure, and it just keeps <coughs> repeating. And the repetition corresponds to the fact that two figures are, show the same atomic motion for two different Ks. <clears throat> okay, so we are now going to say we know the average energy and we know the specific heat. And it's a sum over all modes. The modes are now labeled by frequency from 0 to nu sub d. <clears throat> and you have the number of modes of frequency nu. You have the average energy or the contribution to specific heat of one mode of frequency nu, and you add them all up and you get 1125 and 1126. Good so far? Okay, well, we have now outlined the Debye theory of the solid, and what is left is a little bit of notational trickery. And the notational trickery is we're going to change our symbols. If you look in 11-26, you see that almost everything inside the integral is a function of beta h nu. See it? So we're going to replace beta h nu with the one variable x. Now we can do that, but when we make the replacement, we have to recall that there is a d nu nu square parked outside, yes, and when we convert nu and d nu to x, we pick up some extra factors of beta h, or 1 over beta h, yes. Also, if we're going to change from the variable nu to the variable x, we have to change the limits of integration. And so we change the limit of integration nu sub d, uh, well, we're going to change it to something called the Debye temperature theta sub d, but there's some rearrangements to do th so. And the first is the <coughs> upper limit, if the upper limit before was nu sub d, and we're replacing nu with x, the replacement is the value of x at the upper limit, which is beta h nu sub d. And that's a few lines above 1127. Furthermore, we're going to get rid, go in and get rid of the speed of sound, which we really don't know. And we do that by replacing the speed of sound with nu, which we can do. Of course, when you do that, you pick up, um, you, you also have a density. And if you look hard, there's a density in there. And the last thing we are going to do is to say uh, we will replace nu sub d with the Debye temperature theta. And theta, or rather k theta, is equal to the energy h nu sub d. 
that is, K K Boltzmann's constant times this theta is equal to the energy of the highest state that you have. And we've now rearranged into equation 11 27. Yes? So there is 11 27 after the rearrangement. And um, we can then sit down and discuss what happens in different limits. Well, in low temperatures, what's going to happen? If t goes towards zero, the upper bound on the integral in 1127 is? Zero. No. It's infinity. And we would have integral zero to infinity of this function of x. Well, x is, x is not t, it's just a dummy variable. So if we go to the uh, low temperature limit, this integral just becomes a number. In particular, it becomes the number given in 1128. And perhaps I should ask, um, do either of you, have either of you encountered the Riemann zeta function in your math courses? In that case, you have not encountered the little bits of math you need to do this integration and show it's 4 pi to the 4th over 15. However, it's a number. And the remaining temperature dependence is given by the T cube. That's the only explicit temperature dependence. So at low temperatures, the Debye model predicts that the specific heat goes as T cube, which is actually confirmed experimentally. I, I'm, so, uh, yeah, the specific heat goes as T cube. Okay, you could also do the high temperature limit, and in the high temperature limit, the bounds of integration go to close to zero, but not quite, and you can then do some evaluation, and what do you do to do that? Well, if you look in there, you realize that x is always going to be small if t has gone to infinity. If x is small, you can replace the exponentials with the first two terms of their power series. You can replace e to the minus x with 1 minus x. And if you do that, you end up with equation 11-30. <coughs> now, the virtue of e equation 11-30 is there's an integral sitting there, but you can actually do that integral. And that one's just a polynomial, which you do not know how to do, and there, which is why it's homework, which is why you, and you end up with the final piece of equation 1130, you end up with the prediction that the specific heat is 3n k sub b. Okay. Oh, it's 3n k sub b. Have we heard this before? Yes, it's the law of Dulong and Petit. Specific heat is 3 in case of B, or the molar specific heat is 3R. Well, that's very nice. So what we did is we treated the specific heat three times. We started with the classical picture, and we get the law of Dulong and Petit. Then we went to the Einstein model, which does get a temperature dependence of the specific heat, that was a fairly daring prediction at the time, because at the time there were really not a lot of measurements saying the specific heat of the system depends on temperature. Instead, there, the specific heat was known to depend maybe, maybe weakly on temperature, and having depended maybe, maybe weakly on temperature, there was the funny special case of diamond. But, you know, diamond's very strange. Okay, and we then um, derived equations that look like 1131. That is, we say that the specific heat at each frequency times the number of modes having that frequency added up gives us the total specific heat. Now that equation is much more generally important because you can do much better calculations of what the normal modes of a solid are. That is, you can actually calculate n of nu accurately. And if you calculate n of nu accurately, you can pull out the realistic specific heat of the solid. 
Okay, I am now going to give you some homework numbers. Like, one, two, three, um, five, six, seven, nine, ten, and yes, those all go, that's a lot of problems, but they're all rather straightforward. And then for fun, um, try 11, which you'll find hard, and try 12. 12 is perfectly doable, except you have to realize, I told you, this is a two-level system. If the system is a two-level system, it's only has two levels, and the partition function it has is not the partition function of a harmonic oscillator, which after all has an infinite number of, of um, normal modes and energy levels. Here, each normal mode only has two energy levels, and I will let you write that down while I pour myself something to drink before I get into coughing trouble. Uh, 12 is a model that actually works <coughs> for the specific heat of a glass. Okay. We now skip ahead to a side. We're now done with 11. I am going to say very little about a side D. It's an introduction to quantum mechan formal quantum mechanics and its axioms. And I say almost nothing about it that you would not get in a reasonable first term of quantum mechanics. Well, I say almost nothing until you get to the footnotes at the very end. And the footnotes at the very end um, include, in particular, <coughs> footnote 3, which explains why the description I've just given you of quantum mechanics can't actually be right. And the reason for this is as follows. Suppose we have two quantum states, A and B, two bra vectors. Yes? Mm -hmm. And we add them up, uh, multiplied even by complex numbers. So we have C1A plus C2B. Mm -hmm. Yes? Is that a state of the system? <coughs> Only if it's normal. Hmm? Only if it's normalized. Yes, in some versions you have to normalize. But let's assume it is normalized. Then it should be a state of the system. The statement is it's linear. Well, there's a problem with that because quantum mechanics is supposed to go over to classical behavior with lar for large quantum numbers. And we have the following little difficulty. Here's a mass and its gravitational field. Here's another mass and its gravitational field, yes? Real gravity, general relativity gravity, not to be confused with, oh, Newton gravity, is a nonlinear theory. The gravitational field due to two masses like this is not the sum of the gravitational field due to mass 1 and the gravitational field due to mass 2. And therefore, if I say, this is a state of the system, this is a state of the system, and I just produce the linear sum, including the linear sum of the gravitational fields, it doesn't work. And you have to fix something. Historically, this issue was ignored for a very long time, because, well, general relativity was, came out in 1915, through the 30s and 40s and 50s, there were a certain number of very influential people in American physics, Oppenheimer, for example, uh, who took the position that general relativity should not be a core part of the graduate curriculum. So it wasn't, even for theorists who had to worry about this. Well, that was a long time ago. Okay. I also raise a few other interesting technical issues about general relativity in the footnote, and I will let you read them for yourself. 
Lecture 12 we have already worked. Lecture 12 discusses two issues of quantum statistical mechanics. The first is to show it doesn't matter which set of basis factors you're using, you get the same answers when you do calculations. And that's actually quite important because if you got different answers with different sets of basis factors, you'd have to figure out which one to use. It's not a problem. The second part of the chapter, which uh, is actually quite non-conventional, is to eliminate the fall sheet. When we did, for example, the partition function for the harmonic oscillator, we said the states were n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and if we add up over all of those states, we get the partition function. But what I said is a lie. In quantum mechanics, a complete list of states of the system is a, a can be generated by a variable c1 times state 1 plus c2 times state 2 plus c3 times state 3, etc. <coughs> All of the linear combinations of states, the mixed states, are legitimate states of the system. So we ask a question, which I answer. Why did I suddenly switch from doing a sum over all possible states of the system to doing a sum over this very restricted list of states of the system? And the answer is, you get the same answer either way. But it's much easier just to sum over the basis factors, so that's what we do. And I am not aware of anyone else who discusses this, at least not in a way that I can figure out. Okay, we re so that's quantum. We have now reached chapter 13. Um, are there any problems you want us to do for homework in chapter 12? Um, well, Oh, why don't you try 1, 2, and th 3, okay? Mm -hmm. And those can, I, you can hand in after break, because we're right up against the end of the term. We have seven week terms here. And um, 1 and 2 actually dis do a demonstration of changing basis factors explicitly, but we do it for, it's actually a photon state in essence. You have uh, an, a, an L and an R state, and you have a plus and a minus state. I have to tell you what the helicity states are someplace in the chapter, but there are one plus or minus two and you can normalize if you want to. And what I show that you're going to show is that the change of basis factors doesn't matter. The change in the basis factors does not change the trace. That's a linear algebra statement. And you're going to check some math. Okay? Well, there is one little bit that I sort of skip over, though I've talked about it which is in footnote 3. And the comment in footnote 3 is there's a <coughs> historical question of exactly how Planck finally got to his final understanding. And the answer appears to have been he found the correct math first. And he knew there were some issues, and for a while he looked in not quite where you would have thought from modern perspective. And eventually, genes did the correct classical calculation, and then it was glaringly obvious. Einstein figured it out, and Ehrenfest figured it out. Something is wrong. How do we fix this? So we fixed it. All right, we are not going to do chapter 13, but I will hand it to you over break if you want some extra problems. I will, however, explain what it does. What it does is to discuss quantum statistics of non-interacting particles. There are three sorts of objects whose quantum statistics could be discussed. 
There are Bose-Einstein particles, there are Fermi-Dirac particles, and there are photons. Um, <coughs> Bose-Einstein particles and Fermi-Dirac <coughs> particles have in common the property that their number is conserved. Photons don't. If I have a sealed, if I have photons sealed in a room, they're allowed to scatter off each other, and some of the scattering processes, you can get more photons out. This, of course, incidentally means that a photon gas will thermalize itself if you're real patient. Real patient, well, you wouldn't want to wait a short period of time like the lifespan of the universe or the duration of a PhD degree. You have to wait a really long time. Okay, I am not going to do the ch take you through the chapter, but I will point out the core starting points so you know where to start. And the core starting points are we have particles of some quantum type. And they have a list of states. And the states have are labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. And each state has an energy epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3. The, so we have a total number capital N of particles and they are somehow distributed over states, and therefore, the, if you take the number n sub k of particles in each state, you get equation 13.2. You take the number of particles that have each state, and you add them all up, and you've got to get the total number of particles, don't you? The other thing you can do is to say you multiply the number of particles in a state by the energy of that state, you add up over all possible states, which, by the way, may very well mean that n sub k is usually zero, because there no, most of the states will be empty, and you get the energy E. Yes? Mm -hmm. And we say the energy is separable, meaning um, you can change the n's around and the energies don't move. Let's consider the contrary case Suppose we have um, a um, energy levels of beryllium and its ions, where the energy is not separable. Why? Well, let us start with a naked beryllium nucleus. Here's our na here is our naked beryllium nucleus. Now we will decently clad the beryllium nucleus by giving it its first electron. Yes. The electron in orbit around the beryllium nucleus has a set of energy levels which up to numbers are rather close to the Bohr energy levels, except of course the charge here is bigger. Yes? Mm -hmm. Now let's bring in a second electron. And when you bring in the second electron, each electron separately can be in all possible levels because the Fermi-Dirac statistics of electrons don't do anything yet. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, however, if I say the two electrons are both in the n equals in the 1s shell, the energy of the one, two electrons in the 1s shell is influenced by the fact the other electron is there, and therefore the energy of two electrons in the 1s shell is not twice the energy of one electron all by its lonesome self in the 1s shell. Mm -hmm. Yes? So that's a non-separable case. Non-separability arises if the particles interact with each other, <coughs> which is a normal state of affairs. Okay, now let us say we want to do statistical mechanics. The number of particles is conserved. But I'm going to work in the grand canonical ensemble. Meaning, yeah, the number of particles in the room is conserved, but I left the door open. And particles can drift in and out of the room. And the way we approximate this is we have a huge system in which the number of particles is conserved. 
and the number of particles in this little box can wander up and down. And we look at the statistical mechanical behavior of the particles in this little box wandering up and down as they wander in and out of this big volume. And the big volume is so big that as you change the number of particles in it, it really just sits there. Okay? Okay, well, we set up the grand canonical ensemble, and that's equation 13.3. And the structure of 13.3 is as, pos as follows. Uh, we have a sum from n equals 0 to infinity. The capital N is the total number of particles in the system, which can now have any value it wants. And then there is a z to the n, which z is the fugacity, that new variable we introduced when we talked about the grand canonical ensemble. And then there is a second sum, uh, in 13.3, a second and third sum, there is a sum of the exponential of this object. Well, that sum is, says you take capital N particles and you stick them in, in all possible ways, into the allowed energy levels. Yes? Mm -hmm. And X minus beta sum, the last sum is the total energy of the system, so, in fact, the, everything from the second summation sign on over is summation x to the minus of minus beta e. It's the partition function for n particles. So the grand canonical partition <coughs> function can be calculated from the canonical <coughs> partition function. Now, you might ask, why do we want to do this? Why do we want to have a grand canonical calculation rather than a canonical calculation? And the answer is that in the grand canonical ensemble, the number of particles in each state is independent from the number of particles in each of the other states. Why? Well, suppose I tell you, here is energy level 1. And suppose there are three particles in energy level 1. When we do the sum in equation 13-3, each combination of particles in levels 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. shows up exactly once, once and only once. It shows up once because there is some combination that puts three particles here and two particles there, and two particles there. Gee, that's a total of seven particles, right? Three plus two plus two. There is a state that is three plus two plus two for seven particles, but there is only one such state. There is only one such state because um, we go through the sum and the allowed number of particles is listed from zero to infinity once. And if we have seven particles, and the particles are indistinguishable, all that matters are the occupation numbers, the number of particles in each state. So this is the state 3, 2, 2, and there's only one of them. Yes? Okay, so the number of particles in this is independent of the number of particles in the reps. And therefore, we can do the rearrangement seen in the equation 3.13.4. Because what we say is that the grand canonical ensemble is a sum that allows n1 and n2 and so on to go from 0 to infinity. Each value, <coughs> all values of n1, n2, etc., are allowed. Yes. Um, and having said that, since each combination of the n's appears once and only once, I, w I should write a summation which shows each combination of the n's appearing once and only once. And I actually do that in 13.4, namely each sum, each n sub, e each um, 
n1, n2, and so on is separately summed from zero to infinity, and the multiple sum there generates all possible lists of n's. Well, having said that, I will then say the exponential of a sum in 13.3 is the product of the exponentials. Yes? And so I will split the exponentials over the summation signs as indicated. And there is exactly one factor of z for each atom in the particular state of the system. And so if I write z, if I put a factor of z with each exponential, the correct number of factors of z automatically show up. However, we have seen equation 13.4, at least each of those sums before. Well, there wasn't a z there, but we've seen it before. Those are geometric series. Uh, the summation in 13-4 in go um, n1 to the 0 plus zx minus beta e, that's the first term, plus z square x minus beta e, quantity squared. Yes, that's a geometric series. And because it is a geometric series, we know how to sum it. And we'd go from equation 13-5 to equation 13-6, <coughs> yes, and we have done a resum, except for one minor little detail I have skipped. I said the ends could go from zero to infinity. Well, that's one of the possibilities. That's true if you have classical or Bose-Einstein particles. If you have Fermi-Dirac particles, though, the list of um, states of the system only allows the number of particles in a given state to be 0 or 1. An electron orbital is actually two states, a spin-up state and a spin-down state. Sound familiar? So, we can rewrite the grand canonical partition function into 13-6 is the Bose-Einstein form, where you can have as many particles as you want in a state. 13-7 is the Fermi-Dirac uh, form, where you can have a maximum of one particle in a state. <coughs> well, we should now chug through, except I won't do it, because I said I wouldn't do this chapter, and we can find a sum over all the states, the partition functions, the average energy, the specific heat, whatever you want. Um, the only constraint on that we do is that we're going to do it only for interacting Fermi direct non-interacting Fermi direct particles. There's cheat here. Can anyone think of what the cheat is? The only allowed values of n are zero or one. Well there are the number only allowed occupation numbers are yeah. 0 and 1. The cheat in, equa in all of section 13.3 is there aren't any non-interacting Fermi-Dirac particles. All known Fermi-Dirac particles have an electrical charge. And because they have an electrical charge, they are not non-interacting. Now, there is a bit of a fudge that if you talk about electrons in a metal, they're Coulomb particles, long-range interaction. They're as far from non-interacting as you can get. You can resum all those interactions, and the electron gas in a metal looks as though the electrons were non-interacting. Now, they're interacting, trust me. Okay. We could do exactly the same thing for photons, that's section 13-4, but for 13-4 we have the nice advantage that the number of photons is not conserved. And therefore we can just say in the canonical ensemble, the number of photons of mode 1 goes 0, 1, 2, 3, all of those are allowed, and they're independent of everything else that is happening. Okay, 
and that gives us the photon gas. And that gets, gives us, since one of you did say you were going on a trip, um, there are 11 problems here. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you should try all of them. And I am going to make the comment that some of them are quite easy. Some of them are extremely difficult. Uh, oh, 13-8 is really a thermodynamics problem, which you, by understanding, may not be able to do. Okay? So we have gotten there. Uh, you, if you have not been doing so, you might find amusing to be a, make a point of reading my footnotes. Because some of my footnotes really are footnotes, not literature references. We're done. All right, thank you very much, Professor.